Okay, so I'm gonna read the poem out loud to you one time. I will replace the confusing words with the words at the bottom to better help you understand this. And then we'll kind of break it down um, little by little. So just bear with me for a second. Here I am, I'm gonna be reading it, kind of going back and forth. It says, uh, whoso desires to hunt, I know where is a female deer. But as for me, alas, I may know more. The vain travail or hard work has wearied me so sore that I am of them that farthest cometh behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer. But as she fleeth afore, uh, growing weaker, I follow. I leave off therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Whoso lister hunt, I can assure him, as well as I, that he will spend his time in vain. And carved with diamonds in letters plain, there is written her fair neck about, uh, no le mi tengere, for Caesar's I am, and wild to hold, for I seem tame. Of course, I didn't read it exactly the way it's written, but you guys can see that on your own. Um, first things first, when we did ballads, um, when we looked at structure for anything else, you know, we go with the obvious stuff, okay? So looking at this particular sonnet, it's divided up into two sections, okay? I want you to first count the, the first section, how many lines are there, and then count the second section, how many lines are there, okay? Knowing that, you can quite clearly see that the first section is divided up into eight lines, and the second portion is divided up into six. Um, going back to your PowerPoint and looking at the characteristics of each uh, type of sonnet, you can see that the only one that fits this is a Petrarchan sonnet, or what's called an Italian sonnet. Okay, so that's the first thing that you can you can write down at the top of your paper. This is an Italian sonnet. So I'm going to do that, and then I'll kind of show you what I have. I'm writing Italian sonnet. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to, at the bottom um, where the two sections are divided, I'm going to draw an arrow next to one and write octave on the first part, and then um, an arrow to the second one and write sestet. Okay, so you can see that here. I just wrote Italian sonnet, I wrote down octave, and then I wrote down sestet. Okay, so that's really all that you need to do as of right now. Okay, the second thing that we want to do is look at the rhyme scheme because that, that's one of the most important characteristics of poetry is does it have a rhyme scheme, does it not, how does it work? So I'm going to read the last words of each line to you um, and then I'll kind of show you how what kind of rhyme scheme it possesses. So it says, hind more, sore behind. Mind afore, therefore wind. Wind is gonna be a near rhyme. Okay, it's not gonna be exactly, um, so just kind of deal with that for a second. So if you, if you hear that out loud, you can see that it does possess the Italian um, sonnet rhyme scheme where it's ABBA, ABBA. So that's what you're gonna write down on your own um, sonnet. At after each line, write the letters. So I'm doing that right now. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, and then I'll show you. So you can see right here, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Okay. The second half, I am gonna tell you it does deviate from the normal characteristics of an Italian sonnet. Sometimes uh, authors don't like to follow rules, okay? They like to follow some or like what they feel that they wanna follow and then the rest they kinda of do on their own. That's what, you know, makes each artist different is their own spin on things. So T Sir Thomas Wyatt did not decide to follow this, the um, typical rhyme scheme of the sestet, instead he did his own. So I'm gonna read this out loud to you and um, you know, kinda of show you what we're gonna do down there in terms of rhyme scheme. So it says, doubt, vain, plain, about, am, tame. Okay, so if you're looking at this, the um, doubt does not rhyme with any of the prior words, so what we do there is we write the letter C, okay, because the at the very top we just had A's and B's, okay, so this is a new word, a new um, sound, so we write C. Um, the next one says vain, obviously vain does not rhyme with doubt or anything else, so we put a D there. Um, plain rhymes with vain, so a D goes there. Um, fourth line is about, which we know rhymes with the word doubt in the first line of the sestet, so it's going to be a C. And then finally, Wyatt concludes with basically a couplet, and he says am and tame, so near rhymes, and those letters would be E and E. Okay, so I'm going to show you what that looks like right here. I, this is supposed to be a C. So C, D, D, C, E, E. Okay. 
One other thing that I want to show you structurally is that um, a lot of sonnets have what's called a volta. If you look at your PowerPoint, a volta is a change in thought, okay? A change in the argument. So, you know, um, I will kind of talk to you about the volta once we break down the meaning of the poem, because you won't really understand it unless you know what the poem's telling you. So if you look at the, the octave, I'm going to read it maybe four lines at a time, and then we'll kind of write down what we think it's saying. So it says, whoso desires to hunt, I know where there is a female deer. Okay, so he's talking about hunting and he's hunting a female deer, okay? Um, as for me, alas, I may know more. So we can see that this, the, the speaker of the poem is choosing no longer to hunt this deer. Um, the vain travail, so the, the uh, vain hard work has wearied me so sore. So this guy is getting tired of hunting this deer. Okay, it's a lot of hard work. He's not getting what he wants out of it. So he's getting tired. Okay, he, he's tired of it. Um, he says, because I am of them that farthest cometh behind. So it seems like the more he works and the harder he does this, uh, the, you know, he's not as successful. It's actually, it's actually not working out for him at all. Um, it's worse. He comes further behind in the hunt for her. Okay. But he says, yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth the four fainting, I follow. So he says, yet yeah, even though I'm tired, I'm not getting what I want out of this. I still can't stop chasing this deer. I can't stop hunting this deer. Okay. So the more she flees, the more I pursue her. Okay. Um, I leave off therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. So he concludes his octave by saying, you know, I'm kind of done talking about it because trying to chase this deer, trying to, to catch her, hunt her, is trying to catch the wind in a net, okay? Think back to, you know, what a net looks like. Net has holes in it. Um, you can't catch wind in a net because it just goes right through the holes. I mean, you can't catch it, you can't keep water in a net because it just goes right through the holes. So really what he's doing here is he's saying, it's impossible. I can't, I can't accomplish this task, okay? All right. Um, Kind of looking at that octave, you know, he talks about hunting, but we really can kind of understand that he's not really talking about hunting, if that makes sense. Um, so he's not really hunting a deer. In fact, we, we think that he's hunting a woman. So this is the central metaphor in the poem is that, you know, this man is pursuing a woman and she's playing hard to get and he is not successful in, in getting a relationship with her or, or whatever he's looking for. Um, but he can't stop chasing this woman. Okay, so anyway, that's the metaphor. You wanna make sure you know that. Um, okay, so that's what he says in the octave. Now I'm gonna get into the sestet. It says, whoso is to hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. So here's where we have what's called the volta, the change in thought, because he goes from his experience with chasing her to others' experience with chasing her. So we know that he's not the only person pursuing this deer. He's not the only person um, pursuing this woman, that others are interested in her as well. So he's, tell he's telling them that, yet, uh, or I'm gonna tell you guys, you're wasting your time um, because, and that's what I'm gonna read in the next line. So he gives the reason why it's not gonna work out for them. It says, and graven, so carved with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about, Noli me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild to hold, though I seem tame. Okay, so the reason why she is unattainable, the reason why they're wasting their time trying to chase her, is because she's possessed by somebody else. Okay, if you look at it, it doesn't, it, it's saying like she's got something around her neck. So really, you know, we can assume it's a necklace, it's, a, it's an opulent necklace, and, you know, around her neck, this, this necklace sort of signifies her possession. The only people that would uh, own something this opulent would be royalty, okay? Um, somebody that can afford that kind of necklace. So she's owned by someone with money, and uh, at the very end, he wraps up with, by saying, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So, you know, you can't get her because she's possessed by somebody else that's powerful and has money. And secondly, um, She's kind of wild, like you can't tame a girl like this. You can't tame a deer like that. You know, she's impossible to change, um, to make yours, okay? So that's how, how kind of he wraps up his, his, you know, his poem. So two reasons why she can't be, can't be caught. 
All right, um, I think that is all that I need to tell you there. Actually, that's not all I need to tell you there. Um, so we looked at the poem, we looked at what the poem's saying. Now I wanna connect back to Thomas Wyatt because I said that everything that we learned about Thomas Wyatt does apply to this poem, okay? So thinking back to that PowerPoint, Thomas Wyatt had a relationship with Anne Boleyn. Remember that Anne Boleyn was married to King Henry VIII and King Henry VIII was jealous of the relationship that Thomas Wyatt had with this woman. And, you know, so jealous in fact that he took action against Wyatt. You know, he ordered for his execution um, and then eventually imprisoned him for treason, okay? So we can assume that Thomas Wyatt writing this poem was in reference to his relationship with Anne Boleyn, okay? And this woman that has the diamonds around her neck is her, you know? The diamonds would be given to her by Henry VIII. It makes a statement. It says that she's off limits to everybody else, okay? So anyway, that was the final connection that I had. Um, hopefully this helped you guys, you know, of course, let me know, email me with any questions and, you know, I'll do my best to answer you, you know, as I get them in. Okay.